research throughout this presentation. So um, I'll just go to the next slide. Thanks, Karen. Thank you. Um, so I'd also like to just start by acknowledging um, my deep respects for the traditional owners of the lands on which we're all meeting on today. Um, so I'm personally on Gadigal and Wongal land um, and Uncle Terry is on the land of the Gumbangia people. And I pay my respects to elders past and present. And I'd also like to extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who are joining the meeting today. Um, and also acknowledge all of the participants, collaborators, and the communities that we work with um, who have really contributed so greatly to this work from the very beginning. Thanks, Karen. So I'll just start off with a little bit of a background on some of our previous work, um, which is really relevant because it's led to us developing this Naranga Ginnane program. And so the findings that I'll talk about in the next few slides um, come from the Koori Growing Old Wells study or KGAUS study. Um, and KGAUS is a longitudinal population-based study of 336 older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Um, and people came from five partnering communities across New South Wales, so in the mid North Coast and um, closer to Sydney as well. And so generally what some of this work has shown is that there are high rates of mental health conditions for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, um, including depression, anxiety, and suicidal behaviours. Um, and we've also found that stress and trauma, particularly in childhood, is associated with these mental health conditions in later life. And in addition, um, childhood trauma is associated with dementia in late life as well, in particular Alzheimer's disease. Um, but what we do also know is that Aboriginal communities are strong. And so our work has shown that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander participants in our studies have quite high levels of resilience. And so resilience can be thought of as sort of our, our ability to bounce back and recover from difficult situations or life events. And so what we've seen is that resilience might actually modify or change the relationship between childhood uh, exposure to trauma and stress, and then late life depression. So, uh, sorry, dementia. So in particular, for people who've experienced childhood trauma, um, and you can see them in the dark orange bars on this graph, um, being resilient, so people on the, on the right-hand side of this grant um, identified as being a bit more resilient, um, might actually protect against dementia compared to people who have lower levels of resilience on the left of this graph. So there's a bit of an interaction effect going on there. Thanks, Karen. And so another example of the importance of resilience can be seen when we looked at data from the KYAS study. Um, we had 200 older Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people from that same cohort who were sort of interim followed up and asked about their health. Um, and what we were interested in here is looking at things that we had identified at baseline, um, so as part of a questionnaire, that might predict how people rate their own health, so their self-reported health, when we followed them up about three years later. And so what we saw was just over half of participants rated their health as being good to excellent. Um, but in addition, to some health and medical factors that we noticed were sort of predictive of self-reported health. So things like kidney problems, um, chronic sort of health conditions and um, arthritis. What was really stood out to us was that resilience at baseline was a strong predictor of how people rated their health three years later. And so what this suggests is that um, self-reported health quite holistically um, is being sort of being able also to cope and bounce back from difficult situations. So that really influences how people view their own health and their well-being. And so this is important for us to think about, I guess, because self-reported health has been linked to poorer health outcomes such as morbidity and mortality. Um, and so understanding the factors that contribute to how people view their own health and to their well-being is really important. And so I'll just pass over to Terry now to go through the next few slides. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Louise. Another project sharing the wisdom of our elders. We asked older Aboriginal people about what is important for growing old. 118 people from the Koori Growing Old Well Study answered this question 
and they were able to talk about what was important for, to them. There are some clear themes that came from this work and people highlighted the importance of connection to country, culture, spirituality, dream time, and also passing on knowledge. And older Aboriginal, older Aboriginal people spoke about some factors which are known to increase for, increase for dementia and such as low physical activity smoking. They also spoke about the importance of lifelong education, living a good respect for life and respecting the elders and all of our mob. Next slide, please. So this brings us to why we developed Naranga Ginane. Aboriginal communities already know that mental health is important and the higher rates of these conditions all comes from colonization and the trauma and history that was imposed upon us as Aboriginal people. Our research and partnerships with communities is what led us to developing the Naranga Ginane program. In particular, this program responds to a community identified need to address the impacts of stress and trauma in later life. Next slide, please. And mindfulness for Aboriginal people is about connection. And it is something that Aboriginal people have been practicing now for thousands of years. And for this reason, we decided that a mindfulness based program would be culturally appropriate and could work for Aboriginal people. And on this slide, there's a picture of hard work by Alison Williams that was part of the Sharing the Wisdom project. And we asked this, we use this hard uh, work in the program to talk about mindfulness in a cultural way. Okay, now I'll pass back to Louise. Thank you, Louise. Thanks, Uncle Terry. I'll just go to the next slide. Um, and so now that sort of gives a bit of an overview of the background and, and why we arrived at developing this mindfulness program. Um, and so I'll just briefly go through sort of the feasibility pilot study that we ran. And this was back in 2019, so um, a couple of years, but um, we recently published the results and, and this work was funded by the Aging Futures Institute as well. Thanks, Karen. Um, so I guess a really important part of this program is the co-design and development um, process, uh, which was quite involved and we did quite a lot of consultation and that was a really critical part and something that we wanted to make sure that was well thought out and continued really from inception of the idea of this program at all, um, past the life of this, this pilot study and moving on to further translation and research. So we first received um, support from the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Steering Committee. Um, and this committee oversees KGAO's research and other projects that we run in the Aboriginal Health and Ageing Program. And so they were quite supportive of this approach um, when you know, we sort of spoke about why we felt that the program would be needed and also um, you know, why we were taking a mindfulness-based approach as well. Thanks, Karen. Um, so we then convened an expert working group. Um, so this included Aboriginal and non-Indigenous clinicians, researchers, and also an elder. Um, and we held some uh, workshops to decide what the program should actually look like. What was the basis of the program? Um, how, how would it be set out? Um, and how would we make sure that it was culturally appropriate? Thanks, Karen. And we also worked with a local organization in Coffs Harbour. And so Coffs Harbour um, was where we were planning on piloting the program. Um, and we spoke with local elders and community members and they were really integral in helping us um, design the program and finalize it as well. So we did that by holding a yarning group um, where we spoke about mindfulness and what it meant um, and asked, asked people also what it meant to them. Um, and also spoke about what we were hoping to do and our initial plans for what the program would actually look like. So we kind of brought sort of a skeleton idea to the group as well. Um, and so based on their feedback on that, we then made some further changes to the program before finalizing that sort of initial structure and content 
ready for the pilot. And we did actually get, we did actually add things and change things around a bit based on what community members said as well, which was really important. Thanks, Karen. So this slide just gives a bit of an overview of what the program actually looked like. Um, so we used mindfulness-based stress reduction as the basis of the program. So this involved teachings and activities related to mindfulness and connection, um, but we did adapt the content and exercises so that they were more culturally appropriate. So there were eight sessions in total. Each of them ran for about an hour and a half. Um, and the sessions each had a different theme. So you can see them on, on the left-hand side of this. So um, things like dealing with barriers, awareness of breath, et cetera. Um, and the content then included information about mindfulness. Um, there was also psychoeducation and the teachings that we had were interspersed with actual activities that everyone participated in, such as breathing and awareness exercises. And the sessions also finished with some informal yarning time and a morning tea, so people could sort of debrief and, and have a chat afterwards. Um, and just as an example of some of the ways that the program was adapted to be culturally appropriate. Um, so we had some poems in Gumbangir language. Uh, we made sure that the, the content, the psychoeducation content in particular, and information was related back to the elements. And you can kind of see that through some of the themes um, in the later weeks. And also the facilitators, um, importantly, were Aboriginal people. And so they were able to talk about things in a cultural way as well. Thanks, Karen. And um, this slide just shows the two poems that were created and translated into Gumbangir language, especially for this program. So Lindy Moffat was one of the facilitators and a few weeks into the program, as the pilot was running, um, we had a bit of a chat and she sort of um, noted that some of the poems and the stories that maybe we were thinking of including uh, might not be so relatable for participants. And this was something that we were constantly doing throughout the pilot as well, was reviewing the information that we were putting forth and seeing how we could improve it. So it was a very sort of adaptive pilot process. Um, and she actually came up with these quotes um, based on how she was feeling about the content in the program. And then she worked with some people from the local language center to translate them into Gumbangir language. And so what we kind of noticed was that um, these poems and the translations in particular really resonated with participants and they ended up being a really important part of the program as a whole. And so it's just worth noting that having that flexibility and being willing to respond to participants as the program went along was really critical to the success. And I think that going forward, it's something that we actively plan to keep in um, as part of you know, the plan for rolling this out as well. Thanks, Karen. So this is a bit of a busy figure, but it just kind of steps out the whole process of development, um, piloting, and then following up with the community after we finished the program. And that was really important. Uh, and it was something that when we held the yarning group, community members actually said to us, um, you know, are you going to, what are you going to do with this afterwards? And how is this going to benefit us in the long run? So having that feedback session and debriefing after the program had finished was really important. Um, just to ensure that, you know, community was kept informed. We're not just going in, doing our research and then not translating this work back into the community as well. And so for the actual pilot trial, um, it was quite small. So seven people participated. Um, but despite that small sample, in general, we had quite good attendance rates across the eight group sessions. Um, the program, as I mentioned, was, was sort of co-facilitated. Uh, we had a, a local elder, Uncle Terry um, was one of the facilitators, and also um, Lindy Moffat, as I mentioned. So she had um, quite extensive experience in mental health and was a, a member of the local community. And so because of the small sample, um, the, the next couple of slides, I'll just go through some findings. Um, we focused on the qualitative results. So we were really interested in understanding how acceptable people found the program and also ways that we could improve. Um, we did have some quantitative measures, but we obviously weren't able to run any sort of statistical analyses on that. Thanks, Karen. 
So participants um, fed back to us at the end of the program that they really felt that it helped in some way, for instance, with things like mind wandering or anxiety. So one participant said, I'd be doing something and my mind would be somewhere else, but now I tend to keep it where it is. Participants also noted that it helped them to concentrate, connect and ground them. And this occurred um, notably in the context of family sort of negative events that people have mentioned, um, as well as health changes. Um, but in particular, at, at the time, um, on the mid-north coast, we had those terrible bushfires at the end of 2019, which had led to a few delays to us starting the program. And um, people had not been quite affected by the smoke, um, even as this program was running as well. Um, so, you know, to find these sort of changes we thought was quite positive given all of the other stuff that was going on. Um, and many people also liked the mindful eating exercise um, and found that it helped with the managing portion sizes. So that wasn't something we were necessarily expecting, but one person said, my mind would be on the stress and not on what I was eating. But now this program has taught me to think about what I'm eating every time. Thanks, Karen. So as I mentioned, we didn't have the numbers to perform statistical analyses, but generally when we had a bit of a look, we did see a pattern for reductions in depressions, anxiety and stress scores that looked quite clinically significant and also reductions in blood pressure, mean anterior pressure. And also people um, self-reported benefits to chronic pain as well. So most of the people in the study um, reported having chronic pain and felt that maybe it had improved after they'd participated in the program. And so overall, um, what participants liked was the group setting. So this was done in person, obviously, pre-COVID. Um, and they also liked, as I mentioned before, the, the poems in language and bringing in those cultural elements. Another key sort of outcome from this, which we felt was really positive overall, were suggestions for how we could improve the program. Um, so we asked participants at the end, you know, what they felt could have been improved or what they liked or didn't like. Um, and one particularly sort of prudent example that I, I like to share is um, one of the activities that we did was called a body scan. And a few participants commented on this at the end and sort of said, and to say scan, you immediately think, oh my God, not another thing. And, um, you know, they kind of fed back to us that saying body scan made them think of medical procedures. So it wasn't sort of a positive thing. And so what we've done since running this pilot is we changed the name instead um, into language and the, the translation means tie to body. So we've, we've made sure we don't sort of keep body scan in there, um, the name of it anyway. So I'll just pass back to Terry now to give some reflections on facilitating um, and the next slide. Thanks, Karen. Oh, thank you, Louise, again. Originally, when we started talking about developing this mindfulness program, I was, I was not sure whether it would be right for Aboriginal people because it sounded and looked to me something out of academia and, uh, and I didn't want to uh, go in that direction because what I wanted is to make it into a, a cultural program for us. If we're, sort of gonna, if we're gonna run a program for Aboriginal people, then we've got to make it into a cultural program that we could all uh, get something from. But the more we spoke about it, when I saw our participants responded to the program, it really surprised me. And that made me a little bit more uh, content with, with the program. I noticed that participants remembered the elements were part of their memories, especially as young adults, because uh, the elements like uh, touch, feel, smell, and taste brings back certain memories to Aboriginal people and to everyone, I suppose, but in particular to our Aboriginal people that brought back memories from, from younger days and, and a lot of those memories were pleasant, pleasant memories. So that was, a, that was a positive for us, yeah. And mindfulness is about being connected to yourself, your family and your country. And that is what we focus on in this program. I also remind, I was also reminded of past memories through, through the feel, touch, smell and taste of things and what we spoke about in the sessions. It being, brings back those memories to all of us. 
Uh, next slide, please. And by running this program with a small group of Aboriginal people, we could see that it worked for people and was acceptable. But we used this small trial as a way to work out what else was needed to be changed. And we have done that through throughout the development process. And it is very likely that the reason this program is accepted is because of the co-design. Uh, we co-designed it from the very beginning, including with community members. And we also made sure that we went back to the community afterwards and shared what we had found and our plans to keep the program going. We now will run the program as part of a larger trial to evaluate it in, in different communities. Next slide, please. And most importantly, the program can help our mob to remember and reconnect with themselves, themselves in particular. We also, we, we saw from the small trial that there was, there seemed to be some benefits for, for stress and anxiety, but the larger trial will help us understand more about that. Okay, now I'll pass back to Louise. Thanks, Uncle Terry. Um, I'll just pass to the next slide. Thanks, Karen. Um, and so just to finish off, um, as mentioned, this larger trial that we'll be running, um, we, we have finalised our sort of resources for facilitators just to help guide through each of the, the sessions. Uh, and we also have handouts for participants who take part in the program. So we had this for the pilot, but now that we've sort of more finalised the program, we've um, we've put these together with a graphic designer. Um, and it's worth noting as well that these resources are really specific for running the program on Gumbangir country. So we are, um, as Terry mentioned, also in the process of adapting them for other communities that we're partnering with for the larger trial. Next slide, please, Karen, thank you. And um, this is just to finish off and just, yeah, thank the team and collaborators uh, for all of their work on this, on this project. It's definitely been a group effort. So, um, as well as the broad Aboriginal health and ageing program collaborators as well. And thanks everybody for listening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Louise and Uncle Terry. What a what a beautiful program. Thank you. Fantastic to, to hear about the co-design of it and, and the flexibility of it as well. And, um, we might open to questions. Did anyone have anything that they wanted to ask or follow up with Louise and Uncle Terry? Again, thank you, Louise and Uncle Terry. That was really um, beautiful, actually. I would like to know a bit more about the participants in the program, just in terms of their age and other characteristics in, and in terms of their own experience. So could you talk about that a bit, please? Yeah, of course. Um, I guess I can just mention some of the more demographic kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, things. Um, if, if you like, I'm Terry first of all. So um, they were all sort of um, older. So everybody was, I think, 55 or older. Um, and we had initially sort of intended it for it to be with older Aboriginal people. Um, that's sort of the, gr the group that we mostly work with. So we did approach an elders group um, in the development and then sort of drew on that for um, including in the actual pilot. Um, and uh, in, I think we had all, I think all but one were female. Is that right, Uncle Terry? We just had one, one male in the group? Yeah, sadly, that's what Aboriginal men are like. <laughs> Um, yeah, but maybe Uncle Terry, you could potentially comment a little bit more since sort of, so I, I wasn't there for all of the, um, for, uh, for all of the actual um, sessions, um, but Uncle Terry, of course, was. So maybe Uncle Terry, would you be happy to comment a little bit more just on, on how people responded to the program? I think that was part of your, your question. Yeah, look, uh, uh, the program, the dy dynamics of the program was set for uh, older Aboriginal people uh, because it, it, uh, this program ran in conjunction with our other program, uh, our CAG House and also our MOB Mind Your Brain program, what we're doing right now, which uh, concentrates on dementia in Aboriginal communities. So this is this is one program that 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 uh, was part of that 
overall project. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people, as I said, the people that we dealt with, so probably from the 55 and upwards cohort. And uh, when we first went to uh, talk to them about it, a lot of them were apprehensive, of course, about new things, programs, uh, white people bringing programs into Aboriginal communities and and not uh, you know giving back to uh, to uh, to the community itself. But uh, after all, after talking to us about about the program, and initially we spoke about how we wanted to uh, adapt this program to suit our culture, and that's and that's what exactly what we did. And our uh, the elders elders group that we were dealing with accepted that and and thoroughly enjoyed the program once we once we started yeah and i think just on that as well um thanks for mentioning that uncle terry in terms of our broader work being about dementia um nobody in the in we didn't sort of you know rigorously assess um, people's cognitive ability, but we did, um, you know, do the ACE, uh, like sort of screening tests with people. And most people were, were cognitively intact, but we did have um, one or two people who maybe had some potential um, cognitive impairment, but they were very much able to participate. And so I think um, that's kind of, you know, made us think that, that this program could be used more widely. And um, I, I don't think there would yeah, be major exclusions about that in terms of um, people being able to participate, which is nice. Right. Now, that's really interesting to know. Um, just sort of more of a comment. I've been doing some work with um, uh, migrant communities and refugee communities with mindfulness and, and a team. And one of the things we found in our pilot um, was that people shared the skills they were learning with family and others. So if after that, we always made this a question, have they shared it and who with? Because I think when people find something like this valuable, it's part of that ongoing stuff. And you actually, I think because of the, um, the, the cultural adaptions and the various ones of that have actually reached a lot of people partly through an initial program, but also because in those collective communities, the sharing has become very powerful. And that means that down the track, then when people are talking about what they get out of it, they actually talk about improved relationships because they're sharing it with their son, with their daughter, with their yeah, sister, sister. So I think just having, as you do the bigger program, having a question which talks about have you shared this with anybody? May give you some interesting information about how positive schools are diffused in the community. Yeah, that's a lovely point. Thank you. And it makes me think as well, um, maybe Uncle Terry, you can comment a little bit more on this, but I think um, you had fed back to me, Uncle Terry, that some, you know, as people were going through the program, they would kind of say, oh, I, I kind of do this. Like this, this makes sense to me. I, I do this just regularly. Um, and I think that kind of speaks to it being sort of a cultural thing and stuff that we were talking about, well, that the facilitators were talking about was was very cultural in nature. Um, mm. yeah. yeah, look, uh, we talk a lot about resilience in, in our projects and each, each one of our projects. And it is quite obvious and apparent that Aboriginal people are a resilient people because of the history of Australia since colonisation and all the all the traumas and genocide and all of that, what we had to go through as a, as a people. So that resilience is, is a built-in thing for us. We've we've learned to become resilient over time, and and that is uh, you know as evident still today in our um, in our older people, to be honest. And being resilient is 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 helping them to uh, you know uh, keep out all all the hurts and things that they normally have gone through in their lives. So the mindfulness program is is uh, was one way of getting them to reconnect with themselves, reconnect to, to self, and re reconnect to family. And, and country. 
and and that was that's that's, that's a very important element uh, we think uh, when de when having programs for Aboriginal people is going through that that phase of of uh, reconnection for our elders, and it's not our elders that we you know that we focus on and what we should focus on we are focusing on, but our younger people as well need to become connected uh, to to culture and country and themselves and family. So, you know, that was, that's a very, very important uh, uh, element of, of any program that we, we are involved with. Can I ask a question? Um, so thank you both very much. I really appreciated the presentation and the work that's happening. It's really exciting. I'm just wondering whether you could talk a bit more about the um, role of poetry and art and how that you know contributed to the success of the program what you learned from it I noticed that you were referring to Rumi as one of the poets and then adapting that to a more local context I'm just yeah I'm keen to know a bit more about that did you want to go Uncle Terry I think you should talk about poetry Louise <laughs> I can talk about poetry <laughs> yeah um, I, and maybe you can expand on it a bit, Uncle Terry, as well afterwards from your experience. But, um, yeah, you mentioned Rumi, and that, that's an interesting one. So um, it actually came up during our sort of expert working group um, as we were talking about the development and we had this sort of MBSR sort of mapped out and, and thinking about how that could be used as a basis for adaptation. And that, you know, the Rumi poem is one that is used in MBSR quite a lot. Um, and we initially kind of spoke about it. And, you know, as a non-Aboriginal person, I, I asked um, the group, you know, what they thought about that, because I'm aware that, you know, may, maybe it's not culturally appropriate. Maybe it is. I'm, I'm not sure. And um, one of the, the sort of working group, um, who is a, he's an Aboriginal clinician, um, psychologist, he sort of thought about it and, and spoke to it and said, you know, I think people will actually be able to relate to this because when we think about what is incorporated in this poem and what it's talking about, it's talking about emotions and being able to cope with those emotions and things like that. So the more we kind of spoke about it in that way, um, you know, I think there were elements that definitely we, we, we kept in that we didn't specifically adapt. So we didn't change the wording to that poem or anything like that. But then, you know, I, we'd incorporated some other um, Aboriginal poetry in there week to week. And um, as it was going along, as I mentioned, sort of Lindy, the facilitator, came to me and sort of said, just don't think that these are really relevant right now to, to people. And um, I've come up with these quotes that I think reflect my sort of experiences I'm reflecting on the content and you know I'd like to get them translated and and try those and the difference that you know she saw and Uncle Terry you might be able to comment on that like in terms of people connecting to that content um, was quite quite a lot so we you know we've really thought about that a little bit more because on the surface things might seem like they're going to be relevant but then they, they weren't and I think that's also dependent not just on what country you're on, but also the group that you're working with. And so definitely what we've tried to do is build in, um, you know, in these sort of facilitator guides and, and how we want to approach the program in the future is making sure that there is that flexibility because it's really hard, I think, going into it to always know what's going to be going to be best for that group and just recognising that diversity amongst people and um, being willing to to be flexible with that and respond to people and listen as, as you know I think that was that was Lindy and Uncle Terry really picking up and listening to participants in that way and knowing what what was working and what wasn't so um, I don't know if you want to add to that Uncle Terry. I think you covered it quite well uh, suffice to say that uh, and Lindy and I were were, ba were basing how our, our, our uh, the way we facilitated on our own stories 
what we went through as in our life as growing up and and Lindy did the same thing she had a lot of trauma in her life with with certain elements and and so did I and, and the majority of Aboriginal people at at my age and around our age have gone through all of this trauma anyway so and what it was for us is to okay teach what we knew about connection and being connected to ourselves and having respect for, for nature and, and all things around us and, and being connected to each other was, was important for this group because uh, the group there are an older group, our, one of our elder groups, and that was important that we, you know, uh, facilitated this program on a level that we could both understand and feel feel comfortable with and feel safe uh, with it as well, which I think they got a lot out of it and got a lot of enjoyment out of it. And I did as well because I learned a lot about myself going through this program because I listened to the stories of, of our elders each week and that brought back a lot of memories for myself. So. So uh, I think the bottom line for the Naranga Ginane program is exactly that. It should be incorporated as a, as a cultural program because it helps Aboriginal, older Aboriginal people to connect again to what has been missing in their life. Thank you both. Thanks, um, thanks, Louise and Uncle Terry. I thoroughly enjoyed your, your presentation. Um, I'm just wondering, can, can you talk a little bit more about your plans for the bigger bigger trial and where you're um, specifically targeting location wines? So, yeah, can you talk a bit more about, about that? I'm sure there would be a lot of demand through um, Aboriginal medical services for something like this. So. Would you like me to talk? Would you like to? To speak, Uncle Terry. Louise, you're the lead. Oh, that's not true, but thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so we have um, a larger trial that will be running. Um, it's called the Standing Tall with Our Mob Project or STOMP. And so the Naranga Ginane program forms one sort of arm of that because it's where we're sort of taking quite a, a holistic approach. Um, and so there's also the Standing Tall program, which is sort of a balance exercise app that's also been piloted as part of, um, you know, the Aboriginal Health and Ageing team previously um, and sort of adapted to be, to be culturally appropriate. Um, and so we'll sort of be running those programs um, separately and in combination to look at, um, you know, well-being and how they might be able to help people in communities. Um, and so... We'll be running, uh, one of the arms is um, going to be on Gumbangia country. And so we'll be able to sort of take the, the existing program, for instance, for, Nung, for Naranga Ginane and sort of implement it there. Um, but also we work with communities, um, you know, in Sydney as well. Um, so sort of southwestern Sydney in particular. Um, and so we're currently in talks at the moment with, with um our, those partnering communities about adapting the, the content and making sure that it's appropriate. So, for instance, you know, the, the poems and the language is all Gumbangia language. The artworks, um, as you mentioned before, Mich Michelle, the artworks are all by Gumbangia artists at the moment. Um, and I think just, you know, the way that we've incorporated things has, has been very specific for that community. And so um, the plan is to work out how to adapt that. And we have some ideas about that. You know, we, we want to do consultations in those communities with elders and other community members to see um, the best way of approaching that and what we would need to change. I think the general contents and messages would be the same. It just will be about how we deliver it and yeah, some of the language that we use and things like that. Um, and I think also importantly, and this is something that Uncle Terry, you really identified um, and came out of the working group as well, was the importance of having a local elder as a, as a facilitator. So we, you know, the intention is that we have two facilitators and 
one has one must be a local elder because they bring that cultural knowledge and um, I think that you know that's really critical so um, we plan to start this sort of larger trial it'll be it'll include 200 people in total and 100 of those will have the mindfulness um, like the Naranga Ginane program um, but at the end um, of the, the trial. So we expect it's probably going to run over the, the next couple of years, um, as long as COVID doesn't sort of put any more delays on us, because it was meant to start previously. But of course, um, we all know about that, those delays. But um, yeah, so it'll run for, for the next couple of years, sort of staged, um, you know, in, in different areas. So we plan to kind of start in, in the mid north coast since the program's ready to go there um, and, and start rolling that out if we can. Um, and then at the end of the trial, um, everybody who's been involved in the STOMP study will have the opportunity to participate in any of the programs that they've, they've missed out on. And I guess our intention really is to kind of try and embed the programs in a way within the services um, so that it's sustainable once the trial is finished. And um, you know, as Terry mentioned, that was just something that was so critical when we did the yarning groups, you know, well, what are you going to do in the long run? Are you just going to run this, this trial and then not do anything with it? Where's this program going? And so it's something that's so front of mind, I think, for all of us um, about how we can make that happen. So by having these sort of resources and adapting the programs and then the way that we'll run the STOMP trial is to kind of pass on that information so, so you know, people on the ground, health workers, et cetera, can, can run it. Um, that's kind of our intention with it so that it'll be, yeah, sustainable and transferable across communities. And we're keen to learn through the adaptation process, you know, what works and what doesn't, and then that can be used as a bit of a model for other communities in the future as well, we hope. So. Thank you. Hi, Ginege. Um, sorry, I feel a little bit emotional being a Gumbangia woman and just honoring the first year anniversary of my father, my father's passing from the Flanders Kelly mob. Um, it's a sweat day for me, so I feel a bit awkward. Everyone's in their professional offices, but I'm in week 12 lockdown, so it's all just a bit sweats these days, tired-eyed sweats. Um, I was interested in a few things. I guess I had some musings and some comments. Um, I've been involved with co-design and doing um, training in co-design a few years ago, and for me, one of the questions was, in, in operating in that space, doing research and workshops was, is co-design not the way mob have been doing things for time memorial in culture and in law and in community with family business and cultural business and sorry business. So that's one of my musings or thoughts in the space of co-design, is it not Aboriginal ways of being and doing and knowing that's being really used in other sectors at the moment without that kind of acknowledgement and grounding in country. It's just amusing. I don't have any hard and fast formulated opinions mm. on it in the moment. So that's one, one, one thought that I had alongside um, when we did co-design as opposed to community consultation. The co-design, it involved the voice of authenticity, which is the elders, the voice of the experts, which is, um, so for example, dementia workers, if this was really specifically honed in on dementia. Um, the voice of the observer, the person watching everything from the back, taking notes and making observations, and then the voice of the researcher or the academia. Is this the co-design approach that was used or was it more Yes, yeah, so that was an actual formula that was used. So we did definitely, I guess, try to incorporate, um, as you mentioned, I think the, you know, getting actual people on the ground, dementia workers and things like that as part of your co-design process. I think, Josie, apologies if I missed that. But um, yeah, so we definitely um, 
when we pulled together the expert working group, um, and I think Uncle Terry, please, please feel free to jump in. But, you know, we tried to make sure that it was people who were working with, with older Aboriginal people, also Aboriginal clinicians and researchers as well, um, and really listened and were guided by by what they felt would be appropriate very much so. And same with the community. So, you know, the input that the community had when we had the yarning group, for instance, um, that was very much taken and put into, you know, adapting and changing the program in response to that as well. And also to inform the program from the outset, really. Um, and I guess to the, the whole question of us doing this program at all really came from community in the sense that it was feedback that we'd been getting from people who'd been involved in other research and and what was you know gaps that they could see that needed you know that, that, that were identified that needed to be addressed um, and also the the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Steering Committee as part of our work um, they kind of mentioned you know there's a need for this for this sort of culturally safe brain training and these other things um, that we'd had in discussions. And then we sort of went away and thought about that. So um, I don't know if Uncle Terry, maybe you can comment a little bit more on how you feel in, ter in terms of the work that, and how we, how we ran the process, I guess. Well, yeah, just to answer Josie's musings is about uh, co-design. Yes, you're right, Aboriginal people and, have been doing this for centuries, thousands of years, is, is co-designing a way to live in a country like Australia and live in harmony uh, throughout Australia. So yes, that was, that is, uh, you're very correct in, in, in thinking that. Uh, I don't know whether I can say much more, Louise, you've, you've certainly uh, covered, covered all of that very well and, uh, uh, and Thank I think, you so much. Yeah, yeah, you're right. I have a few more thoughts too. It all popped in at once. Um, I love the localised aspect. Yeah. I yeah. love making resources localised and then sharing and value adding to other spaces. I just think it's a wonderful way to operate. So I love how localised it was and how adaptive it was um, to mob and how it's going to be much um, more impactful in the future with more, more study. I also wanted to shout out to Mars and Emma online. Hi, girls. <laughs> Sorry, I've always checking the participants, seeing who I know on these Zooms. Um, one of the reasons nice to be that in I the same virtual space as you, Josie. <laughs> one of the reasons I signed up to this Zoom is because unexpectedly, I never expected to be somebody that was has been facilitating mindfulness um, Zooms for people battling depression and suicide ideation um, in COVID. So in some ways it might be great if I can follow up and um, with you or Louise or, sorry, I feel to say Uncle Terry, but I don't wanna be disrespectful <laughs> in this professional space. Um, it'd be great if I could follow up maybe and find a little bit more because it's something that I seem to be um, taking to a duck like a water duck, I don't know, that is just flowing. Um, and I guess I feel really inspired by this whole project and the presentation that has been delivered today by both of you has just been really clear, really articulate, really engaging and um, so, so thorough. So. So thank you. It's given me a lot of inspiration for some um, research projects that I'm working on at the moment. Really lovely. Thank you so much, Josie. And I just wanted to also thank you for your musings and your other comments, because I think, you know, as a non-Aboriginal person working in this space, it's something that um, needs to be spoken about. And, you know, I'm very grateful to, you know, for, to Uncle Terry and the other people that I work with for, you um, you know, helping me learn and, and guiding me throughout all of that. And, and I do I do hope that, you know, I am very much informed and and go with, you know, what what Uncle Terry and others think 
um, you know, is the right path. But it, you know, there are so many, many different ways of doing things. And um, yeah, we, we, you know, I hope that we've we've done some some justice for that, I guess. But um, yeah, I do thank you for for pointing those things out because I think they're really important to reflect on. And um, yeah, really critical in this space. Yeah, Vlad, can I just say one other thing is that this program, as we spoke about in, in our presentation, has been developed uh, initially for, uh, for the people that we work with, and that's Aboriginal people in, in five different communities, Aboriginal communities. And it was developed, initially it came as, as a, well, it looked to me as an academic paper, all right? But after a few discussions about, and a lot of talking about, how do we bring this to Aboriginal communities? Well, the first thing we've got to do is adapt it to, in a cultural way that, that uh, Aboriginal people would accept. And we did that all the way through. We made sure that uh, uh, the elders uh, and the Aboriginal organisations we spoke to were on board once they listened to to what the program's all all about. They came on board very quickly, and the elders uh, from the Ab group elders they came on. They were quite willing straight away to sit down and listen to to what we had to offer in the way of of mindfulness, and that was that. And that's uh, I think that's the way of Aboriginal people will accept these things. Once they once they know that uh, everything, uh, when you know, well, what I'm trying to say is, when you go into Aboriginal communities, you've got to be culturally appropriate and culturally aware of the differences between Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people. So that was the important thing. So adaption wasn't all that hard for us to make it into a cultural program. And I think uh, as it stands right now, although we haven't done the, the big trial yet, I think, it's, I think the program is excellent. We've had talks with the other uh, health services uh, about uh, you know, training for them to, uh, to adapt the program in, in their communities. So and I think, uh, and, uh, and it's quite easily done once you get the right people to, uh, to work with. As Louise said, is is so important that okay, if you're going to have a facilitator, a younger facilitator, then you must have an elder. You must have an elder or an elders group to consult with, or even better, if you if you do the mindfulness with the elders group, and that that helps a great deal. So, when you do, if any one of you want to adapt this into your into your communities. That's the important thing. Adapt it to if you if the services you're uh, going to take it into uh, uh, Aboriginal, then you you must you must adapt it into into a cultural program. Mm 